Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this international conference with the title Human Rights Go Local, What Works? The conference marks the end of a one week long academy on field proven research methods on human rights. At the same time, this conference serves as the formal opening of a new UNESCO category two center the first competence center in the world for the promotion of human rights at the local and regional levels. The conference also aims at commemorating the 20th anniversary of Graz City of Human Rights. Klaus Stahl, the director of the International Center under the auspices of UNESCO and I, Renate Kicker, founding member and former director of the European Training and Research Center for Human Rights and Democracy will guide you as moderators through the conference program. Please, Klaus, you have the floor. Herzlich willkommen auch von meiner Seite, sehr geehrter Herr Landeshauptmann. A warm welcome also from my side, Mr. Governor of Syria, Hermann Schützenhöfer. It is my great pleasure to ask you to officially open the conference and for your welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to see the organization of this conference. And it's a great pleasure for me as a governor of the green heart of Austria, namely the province of Styria, I welcome you here to this conference. The training center for human rights, the city of Graz and the province of Styria stand behind human rights and are advocates of human rights. And this is especially important in times like these. The city of Graz has been committed to human rights for a very long time and for 20 years it has now been a human rights city and as such it was the first human rights city in Europe and the fourth in the world and I would like to congratulate the city of Graz most warmly on this anniversary and I see this anniversary also as a an invitation to continue this work in the future the recognition that we experienced by the establishment of the UNESCO Center is another proof of the expertise that the city of Graz has acquired in the field of human rights. The Training Center for Human Rights is the first of its kind in Europe, and it is the second if its kind worldwide. The first one is in Buenos Aires in Argentina as a hub for local activities in human rights. Uh, this center will send important impetus to improve our lives in a sustainable manner and the human rights center will contribute to better cohesion in society a better cohesion of a society that is witnessing some ruptures and this coexistence is also typical for the political approach that we have adopted here in Syria I am a vivid advocate of coexistence and of joining ranks because I believe that in challenging times and there is no doubt that we are certainly living in challenging times now working together and joining ranks is more important than ever in order to counteract any tension there might be in society I would like to thank the UNESCO Center for the promotion of human rights at local and regional levels under the auspices of UNESCO for holding the academy. The academia, international researchers have been working towards a better future in the framework of this academy. And especially in times 
like this, the role and importance of communities and regions is becoming ever more important. Be it is their role as advocates of human rights that is important. The province of Syria is an innovative region a region of science and research. And I would like to remind you that together with the German state of Baden-Württemberg, we are the research champions in the European Union. We are pioneers in supporting uh, companies. We have excellent companies, research institutions, and uh, experts in this field. and. We have a long tradition of cooperation between industry and the academia, and I'm very grateful for that. Graz is a city of universities, so Graz is the perfect location where contributions can be made towards the human rights. Human rights are more than just a cooperation between the civil society, politics, and the academia. The awareness of human rights is anchored and rooted in the minds of people. And we need to make sure that uh, this attitude is adopted by the people. Sometimes this is difficult, and I'm referring here to uh, recent demonstrations. So sometimes it is difficult um, to maintain human rights, but the freedom of opinion, the freedom of thinking is something that is more important than anything else in a democracy. With this event and with the contributions by all the participants from all the countries, we are once again aware that the awareness of human rights and that human rights themselves do not know any boundaries, no nationalities. Human rights are inalienable and they, their protection must be ensured at all times and we must never waver in doing so. Because after all, it is human rights that are the symbol of a vivid, of a rich democracy, and we have to protect them. And I would like to thank you for organizing this event. I would like to wish all of you from wherever you are in the world all the best. And it is now my great pleasure to declare this conference open. Thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Thank you for your welcoming words addressed to the participants of the conference, and thank you for your statement and your commitment for human rights in Styria. Now it is my great pleasure to ask the president of the University of Graz, Dr. Martin Poloshek, for his welcoming words. Thank you. Uh, dear Governor Schützenhofer, uh, dear Mayor Nagel, uh, distinguished guests, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you here on behalf of the University of Graz. Uh, we are very, very proud that this center uh, for, for the promotion uh, of human rights at the local and regional level uh, now has uh, found its home here at our university uh, because our university has a very long tradition uh, on research uh, on human rights. Uh, for those who do not know us, we are uh, founded in 1585 and are the second oldest university in Austria. And we are as well one of the biggest universities. And, and here are more than 4,000 people working here at our university and 32,000 students uh, are studying here in different uh, faculties uh, and schools and, and uh, Human rights uh, play a very important role, uh, not only uh, in the studies uh, of law and, and economics, but as well as in the different studies of arts. Um, and so this center will play a very important role uh, also in teaching as well as in research. And as uh, Professor Stahl already mentioned, um, as, as I'm a professor 
uh, not only for legal history, but also have done some research concerning um, federal and local government. Um, especially I see the importance uh, that, uh, that human rights play at the uh, level of local governments. I think that, that especially uh, local uh, politicians uh, play a very important role uh, concerning uh, human rights, uh, because uh, at, the, at the level of the federal government, we can talk very, very um, scholarly about the importance of human rights and, and uh, professors can do this uh, even better. Uh, but but living local but living local uh, human rights at the local government level and at the regional government level is very very important and governors mayors uh, play a, a very important role um, in in um, implementing and fostering human rights and protecting people uh, from different uh, countries uh, having having different uh, national background different regional background. Uh, so bearing in mind that, that this is a responsibility uh, for, for governors and mayors, uh, we also see that is for universities. And especially our university uh, knows very well uh, that it's important uh, to have a scientific community which can do research, uh, protect it at, at, the, at the university level uh, without political pressures from different sides. Um, so we think that together we with the UNESCO uh, can do some really very important work uh, for, the, for the fostering of human rights. And I, look to, and I would like to say thank you very much, especially to the UNESCO that we have this chair here at our university and also this center and welcome to all the guests from all abroad uh, from all parts of the world, and please, please uh, help our center that it will look into a bright and very active future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this motivating speech. We started with a welcome address uh, given by the student governor, Hermann Schützenhofer, who adopted the idea of developing Styria into a human rights region based on the experiences of Graz as human rights city for 20 years. He was followed by a speech of Martin Bolaschek, the rector of the Graz University, who supported himself the project of establishing a UNESCO chair of, for human rights, as well as the UNESCO center from the very beginning. Thank you. The university provides the rooms and the infrastructure for both institutions and therefore enables a close cooperation with the academia. Now, Klaus, please. Sehr geehrter Herr Landeshauptmann, sehr geehrter Herr Rektor. Um, Mr. Governor, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you most warmly on behalf of the UNESCO Center um, for uh, the promotion of human rights at local and regional levels for opening the conference about successful human rights practices at local level. The conference was preceded by an international academy and uh, we are planning this conference to be the first one of a regular series of conferences in the framework of our mandate to support the international Susta sustainability and human rights agenda of the united nations we intend to support uh, and also contribute to a discussion. We want to trigger the exchange of knowledge, the exchange of practices, and thus contribute to the implementation of successful measures in the cities of the world. I am very happy that so many partners support us in our endeavor. And I would like to mention a few partners here that contribute their the broad range of perspectives. Graz University, the city of Graz, the province of Styria, the Republic of Austria, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN Habitat, 
the United States and Regions and the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. It is an, my great pleasure to welcome Director General for Social and Human Sciences, Gabriela Ramos, and the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, Nada al Nashif, and the Director of the Fundamental Rights Agency, Mr. Michael O'Flaherty. Thank you very much for contributing to this conference. The issue of human rights is still being heard in the many cities of 20 years after Graz adopted the Human Rights Declaration. And we see uh, their commitment because we have more than 300 participants from Japan, Korea, Jordan, Europe, but also from Argentina, Canada, and Hawaii here. Thank you very much for your interest. So what can you look forward to now? We have two hours packed with statements from uh, politicians. There will be a presentation and discussion of the final document of the Academy. We will hear voices and greetings from all over the world. And at the end, the high point of this conference today will be a discussion with um, Ms. Ramos, Mr. Nashif, Director of Lahati, Professor Oberleitner, and the Mayor of the City of Graz, Siegfried Nagel. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome the President of the Republic of Austria, Mr. Van der Bellen. Dear Mayor, Mr. Magel, ladies, Nagel, Mr. ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago, the city of Graz committed to a really great idea, the idea to become the first European city of human rights, based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was a passionate plea for humanity, for freedom, for equality, for solidarity, for the dignity of humans and their fundamental rights. This declaration is an important cornerstone of our shared Europe. It's valid everywhere, anywhere, and it's at home everywhere, anywhere. It's valid in the smallest of villages and the greatest of cities, across continents and across cultures. Doch sie ist nicht selbstverständlich. But sie it is not a given. Ideal, in a way, it's an ideal, something we strive for, an ideal anstreben. state that we um have to strive Idee, for decisively as a society. society. To make this idea, this ideal, a status quo. And in order to achieve that, Klar, we all have to get involved. Nicht immer alles, was man of course, sich not everything works out the way we want to, but at least Wille, we have to have the will, we have to want to strive for it. 1, Article, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights describes a hope for also, the future. Um so Hoffnung let's do whatever we can to make this hope a reality. Und fragen wir uns and let's ask ourselves Time and again, whether we are on the right path. The admission of the, to the European Charter for Equality of Women and Men, the establishment of an anti discrimination office, and now the foundation of the worldwide second UNESCO Center for the Promotion of Human Rights. All of these are very important steps on our path. And they also contribute to make the world, well, let me say it, make it a little better. Dafür spreche ich Ihnen meinen ausdrücklichen this, Dank aus. I thank you most Und ich wünsche Ihnen für die Umsetzung vieler weiterer Ideen uh, alles, all the best alles for the implementation of many more ideas to come. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Herr Bundespräsident. Thank you very much, Federal President. As the next speaker, I would like to call on the Federal Minister for European and International Affairs, Mr. Alexander Schallenberg. Please, the floor is yours. Sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ladies and gentlemen, wir heute alle well, actually, we were supposed to meet in Graz personally, personally but unfortunately, that's not möglich. possible due to the current situation. It is, however, a big pleasure to speak to you, at least online, and honor the commitment for human rights that we celebrate today. The last 12 months have shown us quite bitterly to all of us that human rights violations are not stopped by a, vi by a virus. Quite the contrary. 
fundamental and human rights are increasingly under pressure worldwide, and some human rights violators seem to speculate that they will not be punished in the shadow of a pandemic. We see peaceful demonstrators in Belarus, Russia, or elsewhere who are silenced brutally. We see armed conflict between Libya, Ethiopia, Nagorno-Karabakh, where innocent civilists, where the civil society is hit. The permanently rising pressure on the right of free expression, journalists who have to fear for their life when they do their work, and we also see images of people who are oppressed and persecuted because of their origin, their gender, their religion or sexual, sexual orientation. So one thing is clear, our commitment for human rights must not know lockdowns. And this commitment must happen on all levels, internationally, in bilateral contacts, and also in the framework of international organizations, such as the UN, the Council of Europe or the OSCE. But also at the national level, federal, provincial and municipal level. This also relates to the title of today's conference, Human Rights Go Local. And here, Graz has been having a very special pioneering role. For 20 years now, Graz has been a very successful city of human rights, a, a position that is highlighted by many initiatives. For example, the Chair for Human Rights and Human Security at the University of Graz, the program Writer in Exile, or the work of the European Training and Research Center for Human Rights and mm -hmm. Democracy. And now this unique characteristic of Graz is reinforced once again. With today's ceremonial inauguration of the UNESCO Center for Human Rights in Graz, the first center of its kind in Austria will commence its work. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank all of our partners in Austria. Without them, we would not have been able to realize this wonderful project. First and foremost, Governor Hermann Schützenhöfer, Mayor Siegfried Nagel, and also their teams. And I really thank the UNESCO and Deputy Director General Audrey Azoulay for the fantastic collaboration when we established the center. Ladies and gentlemen, the commitment to human rights was, is, and will be a cornerstone of Austrian foreign and European policy, as is our commitment to the reputation of our country as a traditional place of dialogue and a location of numerous international organizations. However, we can only pursue this commitment credibly if it is also lived and implemented at regional and local level. This area is a very strong and reliable partner. And it really makes me happy to see that Austria is even further enriched by the UNESCO Center as a place of international exchange and dialogue. Building bridges for human rights was the motto of the Austrian Presidency of the Human Rights Council of the UN, which ended only a few weeks ago. And I am convinced that this motto will also become a symbol for the successful work of the center in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Federal Minister. Human rights are a multi-level governance project. Also, the Human Rights Center in Graz is a multi-level government project. And this is why we would also like to invite the uh, Ms. Campos, Steering Regional Government Minister. She will be in charge for the UNESCO Center. And of course, she... Uh, is also an important voice today. The stage, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the UNESCO Center for Human Rights, it is a really great pleasure for me to be with you today online, but at least I'm part of this event. And I want to send my very best greetings for the proud anniversary of 20 years the UNESCO Center for Human Rights in Syria. For me and for many of us, it's not just a day we celebrate the Union, it is actually a question of attitude. How does the province of Syria mit Ihnen the issue ein bisschen of human rights? And together with you, I'd like to look back on the past 20 years. 20 years is a long time, a proud period of time, and I would also like to mention one of the co-initiators, our former mayor, Mr. Alfred Stingley, and those who knew Alfred Stingley, know that even back then, he was very much involved in the process of the co-initiated and co-initiated center, and even today, he is still a true fighter for human rights in the province of Syria. He and many others, 
Sozialland des Soziallandesrätin äh, in besonderem Maße, wobei ich betonen möchte, es ist zu wenig äh, über Menschenrechte zu reden. Es ist zu wenig, Menschenrechte in Papier festzuhalten. Menschenrechte müssen gelebt werden. Und ich bemühe mich in meiner Politik auch zu zeigen, was Menschenrechte bedeuten. Viele von uns tun etwas in diesem Bereich. Und ein Riesendanke von mir an politische Mitstreiter, Mitstreiter. Ein Riesendanke an die Expertinnen des Zentrums. Aber vor allem ein großes, großes Danke an die Zivilgesellschaft. Sie zeigen Haltung, sie zeigen, was die Steiermark ausmacht, dass wir zueinander stehen, dass wir füreinander da sind. Und das ist die gelebte Welt der Menschenrechte in der Steiermark. Ich wünsche noch einen schönen Verlauf dieser Konferenz. Dankeschön und noch eine schöne Veranstaltung. Thank you very much and enjoy the afternoon and evening. Thank you very much. Madam Minister. On our program, and I kindly invite Morten Kerum as one of the leading contributors to present the Academy's outcome document with the title Building Bridges Between Local Governments and the Scientific Community to Promote Human Rights. Morten Kerum is a director of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Sweden since 2015. Prior to that, he was the first director of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights in Vienna from 200, 2008 to 2015, and even before founding director of the Danish Institute for Human Rights. I had the pleasure to get to know you already then. So please, Morten, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Renate Kika, and uh, also thanks to, uh, to you, Klaus. And I really want to start by congratulating uh, you and your entire team uh, that has organized this uh, magnificent uh, academy and now this uh, conference. It's uh, extremely, I know the, it has been a major undertaking, and, uh, but you have really had a lot of success with that. So congratulations with your achievements. The outcome document that we are going to look further into in just a second will be one of those texts that uh, people will return to for inspiration, as well as a tool to inspire academic institutions and local authorities to collaborate closer, to create that better space, that better city for all to live in. But when thinking about it, I think it is a little bit surprising that we need such a document to insist that policies and actions concerning human beings shall be evidence-based and research-based. Just try to consider for one moment that we were a group of engineers that found it necessary to write a document underscoring the importance of doing a proper analysis and study of landscape prior to building a bridge prior to building a tower. When issues are so-called human-centered, then they are considered soft, and we all have some sort of gut feeling what will be the right or the wrong approach. Sometimes it works, often it doesn't. In short, this is what the human rights-based approach is all about, a human-centered, evidence-based work methodology. A few days ago, I spoke with a doctor working at a human rights-based hospital in Sweden about what they had done differently from the regular health services during the COVID-19 crisis. They had done a lot of what you will find in the outcome document. They had analyzed who would be left behind during the pandemic and ensured that information and health services reach the ethnic and linguistic minorities, persons with cognitive impairments and other vulnerable groups in the local community. In a study that we conducted at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute together with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in 15 countries, it was clear that what this hospital had done is not the norm. So that is in short, what this document that we are here to talk about 
uh, is all about. In the preamble, it introduces the framework and the raison d'etre of why the link between research and local governance is so important. That is followed by 14 points uh, outlining the commitment by local governments to resort to research on human rights at local level. When lo looking closer, we find in the preamble, first the normative framework of the issue, which I always find is extremely valuable. Then it's all there on, uh, right in front of you. Of particular interest is the listing of key principles adopted by international and regional networks of cities. Extremely rich reading. From there, it moves to stating the obvious, which unfortunately is not always so obvious, namely, why shall local authorities uphold human rights? Local authorities are by definition closer to citizens than other authorities. So they are first in line as duty bearers to respect, protect and fulfill all these rights without discrimination. This is followed by a strong reference to the interlinkage between human rights and the SDGs. Let's see these two uh, elements in, in close uh, interaction. The remaining part of the preamble is devoted to outlining different aspects of the importance of re research to enforce the human rights-based approach to local governance, which of course will foster evidence-based decision-making, which it's all about. Importantly, we are reminded of the academic freedom, which is not only a right, but in the end also what advances credible and quality research. This is not always recognized as we all know, why scholars time and again are under political pressure, either to deliver predetermined results or stay silent. This is the pre preamble. Then let's move to the commitment part, the plan of action. What is it that the communities, local communities commit to? This part opens with the commitment to base the development of policies, programs, and decision-making processes and their monitoring and evaluation on research on human rights at the local level. From this, from there is highlights, uh, from there the document highlights that research should build on human rights indicators, giving account of the respect, the protection and the fulfillment uh, of human rights. Indicators are like our guiding tools. But it should also investigate potential synergies between local efforts to measure the progress in the enjoyment of human rights and local efforts to measure the progress towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. So again, mirroring the link between human rights and the SDGs, which are so crucial. Following from there, four paragraphs are devoted to different aspects of using quantitative and qualitative data in the research and the necessity to complement existing data with additional human-centered data relevant for marginalized groups. I mean, the data is, is key because without the data, we simply do not know what happens out there in our communities. We need to know more. As reflected in the preamble, the local governments commit to respect and ensure the scientific freedom of researchers, as well as their freedom of information, expression, and association. This implies their right to seek and receive information, to freely communicate research results to others, and to publish and publicize them without censorship and to collaborate, of course, with others, both within and across borders. Without this commitment, the entire collaboration is redundant, because then you don't need research if you will not let the researchers do their work. 
Finally, there is a commitment to exchange existing knowledge and experiences. And this is, should happen at three levels. Uh, first, between the local communities and the international and regional uh, organizations, as well as national human rights uh, institutions. Secondly, between cities, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, exchange and also establishing networks where such exchange can take place and co-creation be developed. And last but not least, certainly is the collaboration between the local community, local authorities with the research uh, environment, research uh, institutions. This should happen with the aim to build bridges between local governments and the scientific community, and not only locally, nationally, but also at the global level. So I'm sure that you will recognize that this is a very rich uh, document that has been pulled together over the past uh, week, uh, 10 days. Uh, and I've only paid very su superficially uh, attention. I've only introduced it very superficially. Uh, so please dig into it. There's a lot to be found uh, in the document. And I'm sure that uh, you will be inspired by the reading. And I think this will be the outset for very important collaboration that we will see in the future between local authorities and the research environment. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, for the presentation of this uh, important outcome document, which will be shortly scrutinized in a high level panel discussion moderated by you. Before, when we come now to our next program point, um, Voices from Around the World, we would like to encourage all participants to send statements and comments to the chat room, which we will present them after the video messages. And um, we may announce now the video messages, which we have um, already received. Please, Klaus. Ich darf als erstes eine Botschaft von uh, It is my great pleasure to start the video messages with the first presentation by the president of the Austrian UNESCO Commission, Sabine Haag. In November 1945, in November 1945, also 75 years, 75 years ago, nach Ende and almost des after the end of, wurde von der almost right after the end of World War II, the international gegründet. community founded Ihr the UNESCO. Its aim was and is to apply Kultur, education, science, culture, communication, and also collaboration and partnership in these areas to, make, to work on a permanent level and to maintain peace and security around the world. These aims are based on the conviction that it is the spirit of everyone and every person where the ideas of freedom and justice have to be enshrined. A fundamental, perhaps the most fundamental pillar for the work of UNESCO were and still are the human rights. The human rights and their respect have to be fostered and strengthened. And this is part of the DNA of the organization. It's also part of the first article of its constitution. The UNESCO in 1948, three years after it was founded, was also very much involved in the formulation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as the first UN specialized agency, UNESCO recognized these rights or this, or this declaration uh, immediately after its adoption by resolution. Human rights affect the competences and mandates of UNESCO, such as the right to education, the right to participate in cultural life, the right to participate in scientific progress, the right to freedom of expression and freedom of information, and the right to access to clean water. But not only respecting its fundamental principles, but also scientific discussion about human rights have always been a central 
Und so mehr freut es mich als Präsidentin der österreichischen UNESCO-Kommission, dass es gelungen ist, mit der Einrichtung von Austria zu fördern, dass wir uns mit dem internationalen Center für die Promotion von Human Rechten auf der lokalen und regionalen Ebene unter den Auspices von UNESCO können wir mehr zur Menschenrechten beitragen and a social enshrinement of human rights, especially in the human rights system. By involving forces and actors from civil society, we follow one of the main principles of, the UNESCO, of UNESCO's work. This is why the content-related orientation of the new center actually reflects UNESCO's um, ideals in two ways, evidence-based policies by um, combining it with research and uh, the respect of human rights and by also involving local actors to strengthen the ideas for peace that were based, that were the basis for the foundation of the UNESCO 75 years ago. I want to congratulate you most rigorously and also wish you a very successful conference. All the best to you and stay healthy. Vielen Dank, uh, Sabine Haag. Thank you very much, Sabine Haag. Secretary General of Africa, United Cities and Local Governments of Africa, an umbrella organization for African local governments founded in 2005 in South Africa. Please, jean -Pierre. Good afternoon, I'm addressing you as the Secretary General of the United Cities and Local Governments of Africa. And I'm very happy to be part of uh, this conference on Human Rights Go Local, organized by the UNESCO, the International Center for the Promotion of Human Rights at the local and regional levels, and the UNESCO Chair in Human Rights and Human Security of the University of Graz in Austria. Mine is to say that you are totally right to say human rights go local. This is the only way that we can get a chance to leave no one behind. In Africa, there is a strong demand for respect for human rights, not only in words, but effectively. Our world organization, the United Cities and Local Government, has set up a political committee on the right to the city and to inclusive territories. To translate on the ground the Bogota commitment enshrined in the new urban agenda adopted by the United Nations in 2016. Furthermore, UCLG is engaged in the, the localization of the provision of different instruments adopted by the United Nations, including localizing Agenda 2030 and the new urban agenda, the Global Compact on Migration, the Generation Equality addressing the Beijing Plus 25 processes, the right to affordable housing, the right to access for people with disabilities, the digital right to address the digital divide between cities. All these proposals on rights going local are summarized in the post-COVID decalogue and in the Pact for the Future that UCLG is proposing to the world. I think it's time to go local, and I think that only through going local should we be able to walk the talk. I thank you. 
Thank you, Secretary uh, General. Um, the next speaker I have the pleasure to announce is Mr. Lee Yong Suk, the mayor of Gwangsu in Korea, South Korea. 안녕하십니까. 대한민국 광주광역시장 이용섭입니다. 유럽 최초 인권 도시인 오스트리아 그라츠시의 인권 컨퍼런스 개최를 진심으로 축하드립니다. 코로나19로 인해 인권 분야 네트워크 교류가 어려운 상황에서 뜻깊은 행사를 개최해 주신 그라츠시와 유네스코 그리고 유엔 인권 최고 대표 사무소 EU 기본권 기구를 비롯한 많은 관계자들께 감사드립니다. 세계적으로 경제적 부는 향상되고 있지만 아직도 많은 사람들이 최소한의 인권조차 보호받지 못하고 있는 안타까운 상황입니다. 특히 코로나19로 국제적 연대가 절실히 필요한 시기에 개최되는 이번 컨퍼런스는 도시들의 인권 경험과 정책을 공유하면서 세계적인 인권 수준을 한층 더 높이는 계기가 될 것입니다. 민주인권평화의 도시 광주도 지난 2011년부터 세계 인권 도시들과 인권 활동가들이 참여하는 세계 인권 도시 포럼을 개최해 오고 있습니다. 이 같은 연대와 소통의 장이 많아질수록 우리 지구촌 가족들의 삶이 더욱 행복해지고 풍요로워지길 바랍니다. 다시 한번 그라치 인권 컨퍼런스 개최를 진심으로 축하드리고 올해 10월 건강한 모습으로 광주 세계 인권 도시 포럼에서 다시 뵙기를 희망합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Um, we've got another message uh, from the city of Bangu in Korea, and um, I call on Jong Ju Jin, senior advisor for human rights. Please, you have the floor. Congratulations to this Human Rights Go Global Conference at the 20th anniversary of Human Rights City Grants from the city of Gwangju in South Korea. Gwangju is a city of 1.5 million, much bigger in size than Graz, but we have been learning from Graz in many different ways. For example, Gwangju began to develop itself as a human rights city only in 2007 much later than Graz. We also began Human Rights Department in 2010. We began Human Rights Cities Forum in 2011. The World Forum is helping us to learn and grow as a human rights city continuously. I'm sure that this academy and conference will help Graz and the world to learn and grow for the human rights protection and promotion at local and global levels. In the near future, I also hope that there will be much great contribution from the International Center for the Promotion of Human Rights at the local and regional levels under the auspices of UNESCO. Auf Wiedersehen. OK, thank you very much. Um, now we have received um, on our chat channel uh, messages. Um, but before um, we listen to Frederic Hanotier, president of the Human Rights City Network from Brussels, please. My name is Frédéric Anotier, and it's a great pleasure to participate to this high-level event aiming at supporting local authorities with knowledge, apply research and good practice on how to implement the international human rights agenda at local level for the people and with the people. The 20th anniversary of Graz as the first human rights cities in Europe, but also the official inauguration of the International Center for the Promotion of Human Rights at regional and local level as a UNESCO chair 
put the center in a unique position to promote human rights at local level. And it is an honor for the Human Rights City Network to contribute to the global outreach of this conference. We see it as fundamental to encourage, but also to support cities in Europe, but beyond Europe, to adopt a human rights-based approach in the way cities are governed. Cities dedicate to human rights and democratic values are better equipped to respond to urban challenge and crisis, being more resilient and inclusive. A combination of experience and research of human rights cities should be made available to other cities who would like to become one, but also to partner institu institutions through training program, practical toolkits, and urban human rights policies. The importance on an evidence-based approach to human rights policy making and its implementation is essential to reinforce accountability of local authorities, but also the trust of everyone to be taken in consideration. We are strongly supporting the unique proceeding of the Academy, but also the outcome of the conference to reinforce the resilience and the sustainability of the human rights city movement. We believe that together with the key stakeholders reunited here today, we can further expand the number of human rights cities around the world and therefore bringing more social justice and humanity to create a better future for everyone. We would like to once again thank you for inviting us to, to contribute to this conference, which is another milestone in the development of the human rights city movement. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Frederic, uh, für die Botschaft aus Thank you very much, Frederic, for your message from Brussels to Graz. Well, you should have visited long ago. We agreed that you come to Graz a long time ago, but unfortunately, this is not possible at the moment. Renate Kicker and myself, we are now going to read some of the messages that were written in the chat. We received greetings from UCLG Africa, Najat Zarouk from the African Academy for Local Governance for, with which we cooperate closely. We have another um, message from a participant of the Academy from Nepal, Naresji. Um, he said, um, I'm very happy to be in the part uh, of this process and I learned a lot more about university and research of human rights. Thanks a lot from Nepal. Um, we have a greeting, another greetings from Morocco. Um, we have uh, congratulations to the interpreters uh, team. Obviously, they do a great job, which I am convinced because we worked uh, quite a lot with them already. Um, okay, we have also um, congratulations from our dear colleague and founding member of the European Training Center, um, Wolfgang Benedek, who contributed also in the Academy. Um, he congratulates to the excellent outcome document. Maybe the emphasis also that human rights research is serving human rights education, which itself is key for the functioning of human rights at the local and regional level. Thank you, Wolfgang Benedek, and um, we have um, worked so long and successful together, so we are uh, both happy about this uh, conference and the outcome document. Thank you, Morten, um, who is saying, and we need to pull the resources 
together the demand is very big. Menschenrechtsnetzwerke müssen weltweit zusammenarbeiten. And there is another message by Dr. Razanu who says human rights networks must cooperate worldwide. This is very much in the spirit of our academy and of the human rights city of Graz and other like-minded cities. I see that everybody is present and I would now like to ask the participants of the panel discussion and ask Morten to introduce the high panel discussion because I see that all the participants have already joined us in this meeting room. Morten. Thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, and uh, it was a very interesting presentation. We have just been through from all over the world. Uh, and um, I would say I look very much forward to the discussion that we're now going to have in uh, with this uh, very prominent panel where we will address a number of the issues uh, that are raised uh, in uh, the outcome document and get the perspective of the different panelists. And I must say, what a treat to have such a prominent uh, panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have a uh, mayor of Graz, Siegfried Nagel. We have a uh, deputy high commissioner of human rights, Nada Al Nashif. We have uh, Assistant Director General at UNESCO, Gabriela Ramos. And we have the Director of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, Michael O'Flaherty. Uh, and we have UNESCO Chair in Human Rights at University of Graz, Geert Oberleitner. We uh, have approximately uh, 50 minutes uh, for our uh, exchange uh, in this panel. And uh, we have uh, five questions that we sort of would like to uh, address different aspects of the uh, uh, outcome document. And uh, so each uh, uh, question, uh, I will uh, sort of say kick off by asking one of the uh, panelists to give a short introduction to their, her, his or her perspective uh, on, uh, on that for three minutes. And after that, the uh, other panelists will get the chance to uh, come in uh, with uh, shorter comments. All added up, we have approximately eight, nine minutes. Uh, per uh, question. So uh, without further ado, I think we should uh, uh, get the ball rolling. And uh, uh, and my uh, first uh, uh, question, I, I will turn to uh, our virtual host here, uh, Mayor Siegfried, Siegfried uh, in Nagel. And uh, I mean, Graz has been uh, now a human rights city for 20 years. And uh, luckily we see more and more uh, local uh, authorities, uh, regional and uh, uh, city authorities active in promotion and protection of human rights. How, how do you see this role evolving? I mean, you may not, but the city has been involved for, for 20 years. And, and what is needed to support those cities that engage deeper in human rights? So, Siegfried Nagel. Ja, meine geschätzten Damen und Herren. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the citizens of Graz. I am deeply sorry that we live in times where we need to cover our faces. It would have been so much nicer to welcome you here at an anniversary event here in our city of Graz. We are celebrating a very important moment here in Graz. And to mark this occasion, we have uh, the UNESCO Training Center for Human Rights now. And this is great. I would like to thank everybody involved in organizing this conference so that we can celebrate our commitment and also the UNESCO Center. I would like to thank the representatives from UNESCO. I am sure that everybody uh, knows that I am a big fan of UNESCO. UNESCO is the small sister, if you so want, of UN. And we live by its principles and we implement its principles. Graz is not only a cultural heritage city, we are also a member of the creative cities, the cities of design. 
And it was also very important for me as a mayor to support a statement that relates to the way in which we live together in our city. Precisely 20 years ago, the former mayor, Mr. Alfred Stiegel and Professor Benedek, we're sitting together and had the first idea of making Graz a human rights city. And I was very pleased that I was part of these discussions 20 years ago. And I can share with you, with you mayors all around the world, that this is something that will pay off. It is rewarding for the citizens of a city. It is rewarding um, with regard to cooperation with international networks. And it is also rewarding for the mayors. And I can say that because I have been reelected four times and I can really look back to a very long experience as mayor of a human rights city. I would like to thank for the financial support for the UNESCO Center for Human Rights. I would like to thank for the dedicated commitment that you have shown to this center. And I would also like to thank Dr. Kicker and Dr. Stahl for their excellent work in the field of human rights. They have always been supporting us and provided very valuable assistance. What I appreciate most about this document, and I am sure I can come back to that later, is one uh, aspect that I'm most deeply convinced of. The key to human rights is within the communities. It is with it lies with the people who are in charge of communities and they need to be networked more efficiently. We need more networking. Mayors can achieve a lot for the people, for the citizens in their cities, but all the members of the local governments and the mayors can really bring about change if they network more closely. And this should be the ultimate goal. And I am very proud uh, that UNESCO placed so much trust in our city with the establishment of this second UNESCO center. And also for underscoring the, uh, the network, uh, which uh, we find is, is so crucial. So let me uh, turn to another Nashif. Uh, from the Office of the High Commissioner. Lovely to see you again, Morten. And let me start by congratulating Mayor Nagel for the 20th anniversary um, and thank very much Gerd and Klaus for the invitation. I hope you're gonna ask us back uh, to, to grasp before too long, uh, Mr. Mayor and all of our friends um, at UNESCO. Um, it's clear to us that local governments will continue to have a very important role to play as the main entry point for inhabitants to claim human rights, in particular housing, health, education, security, culture. We're talking a lot about localizing the protection and the promotion of human rights. And I think that local authorities can also be more innovative. I think they can lead transformative ways of implementing human rights policies that we take great pains to articulate at the national level, uh, including through the application of human rights indicators and data. I'm aware that many of the practitioners of local government have presented during the academy some of the remarkable work. We have certainly accompanied uh, the work of mayors across the world this past year. And I think it has shone a light on the potential, but also the achievements. Um, dealing with complex human needs, resource constraints, understanding trust deficits that have grown between citizens and state institutions, as all of these local level actors, particularly the mayors and their institutions, have dealt with lockdowns, confinements, and economic fallout. Um, I think that uh, we have seen uh, how global challenges translate uh, at the local level, uh, and we've seen how crucial the role uh, is in the response, in the articulation of recovery plans. Uh, we have taken great pains uh, at the UN Human Rights Office to put human rights at the center of, of the recovery as we have tracked violations of human rights across the world. Um, and we certainly feel that it has fallen to cities quite often to manage to implement 
some of the mechanisms of the recovery with the growing pressures of urbanization and destitution and poverty, with the growth in economic and social inequalities, with the negative political discourse that has manifested itself in many parts of our world, developing and developed, um, that has led to further marginalization and compounded vulnerabilities. I think in view of all this, we understand how important and at the same time, how uh, critical for the overall recoveries the local broker governments can be. I, I mean, obviously we have a lot of good examples. I won't take a lot of time, but in the UK, we saw what local authorities did to offer emergency uh, accommodation to rough sleepers, this issue of shelter and homelessness uh, in cities, access to clean water and sanitation, as we spoke about, fighting the pandemic, and then the coalition of cities for digital rights, reaffirming access to information and making sure that there could be guides to city leaders and urban managers and other stakeholders to use technology constructively in combating the crisis. Um, what can we do more and how can we do it? We will continue to support working with our um, uh, colleagues and friends uh, at UNESCO and I'm delighted Gabriela, of course, is carrying the torch for us moving forward. Um, but we will continue to support local engagement on human rights. Research and sharing of best practice is, is one clear one, but I also want to say now that the first academy has taken place, but also the capacity building and the twinning efforts that we started with this chair in particular and this institution. I think working in this case, I remember, I think with the Arab world um, to make sure that we can really uh, multiply, amplify the lived experience um, and make sure that we can continue uh, on this path, bringing everyone with us in order not to leave anyone behind. I'll stop there. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Nada, and also thanks, I must say, for, for all the support that you and, and the office uh, is offering to uh, to this particular work. It's, uh, it's very uh, crucial uh, in sort of saying at this stage of, of uh, global uh, development. So thanks for that. Uh, I see now uh, Michael O'Flaherty. Michael? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, thought I did it. After a year, you'd think I'd get it right. Um, Martin, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody. Congratulations, Mayor Nagel, for 20 years. It's a proud achievement. I knew about Graz before I knew about any other city in Austria because of your record on human rights. Um, Congratulations to Gerd and to all the colleagues at the university uh, for the fantastic uh, initiatives that we're marking today. Let me start where the Deputy High Commissioner also came in and acknowledge the extent to which we have to identify cities as champions of human rights. Uh, uh, you gave examples of cities in the context of COVID and I couldn't agree more, but here in Europe, we can't help but think also in the year before COVID of cities as champions of democracy. Uh, and often when we, when we were we were we were deeply concerned about the fate of a particular uh, EU member state uh, in, in in terms of some basic values, you could look to the city for principles. Um, that said, uh, just a few quick observations at this ent entry point of the conversation. Uh, I feel that the human rights cities movement, for all its great importance, has been a rather slow movement. Uh, and uh, perhaps now we need to grab the impetus to move it forward um, uh, 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 with, 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 uh, with far more cities committing themselves to being uh, human rights uh, cities. Um, for that, I think we need to make a greater commitment of institutional support. I, I, I note that the UN is heavily engaged here, and I applaud that. Uh, we at the Fundamental Rights Agency are also ratcheting up our own, uh, 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 our own uh, activities. Uh, for instance, through uh, the... Um, efforts to work with cities in the EU uh, towards identifying uh, shared standards, the so-called framework of commitments, which we're developing. And we're also trying to create spaces where cities can speak to each other and with all of the other human rights actors. And the, um, the last thing I would say, and I'll stop with this, Morton, if I may, and that is that um, what I would like to see coming out of today, among many other things, is a commitment of national entities, bits of the national human rights infrastructure to go local. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm thinking in particular of national human rights institutions. Some do, many don't. 
uh, 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 some are very much capital based, capital focused, which, by the way, is inevitably a function of limited resources in many cases. I acknowledge that. But nevertheless, I think it's time now for the cities to reach out and, 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 and extend and have accepted a hand of friendship for a better partnership to go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and, and thank you very much for, for making that point, which I, I definitely share with you. I think one of the early FRA reports uh, sh showed us that those national institutions that had a, a strong outreach and were well known were those who had a presence at the local or regional level. So very important. Thank you very much for this uh, opening, uh, really decent remarks. And let's move now to uh, the second question, which again is also reflecting back to the uh, uh, to the doc outcome document, namely what we talked about here on the link between human rights mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, SDGs. And um, and here we uh, uh, we now see that the SDGs have really obtain the momentum, there's an increased understanding of the link between human rights and, and the SDGs, which can actually in many ways give human rights an additional push. So I would like to now turn to uh, uh, Gabriela Ramos uh, and ask, how can we further build on this particular momentum uh, that has been uh, created with the SDGs and uh, also take deeper the promotion and protection uh, of human rights uh, uh, together with the SDGs. So, Gabriela. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. It has been uh, great to be here with you and to listen to the previous uh, conversations. Congratulations for the launching of this fantastic center. Congratulations to GRASS. Congratulations to the commitment that you all have to the promotion and defense of human rights. This is the right question uh, to do, Martin. I think that uh, uh, the, the, the most important message that the SDGs delivered, uh, and thank you, Nada, because it's great to be in a place where your predecessor had put everything at the table, <laughs> and it's a, it's a fantastic work. Uh, but I have to say that the main message of the SDGs is leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. And therefore, even if I see it from the economic and development perspective, each one of the targets, each one of the goals had to be expressed also in terms of how they reach out or not to people. How, how do they enjoy the benefits of delivering of access to good quality education? How much do we deliver for women not to be discriminated or not to suffer violence, which is one of the terrible pandemics that we are uh, experiencing now. How do we deal when we need to treat with dignity and, and provide with the rights to migrants or people that are running away or refugees? I feel that every single target of the SDGs can really be translated into very important work to defend human rights and human dignity. And I think this is the beauty of the, of the moment we are celebrating today because everything links together. We cannot ignore the fact that we are in a digital platform in the COVID context, which has had a very asymmetric impact because certain groups of people are not enjoying their rights as some others are doing it. And having a city committed to, to this agenda, which you have been for so many years and congratulations for that, uh, means that uh, we need to look what is the context and the context is not great because we see that if you belong to certain minor minorities you have three times the chances of getting sick or died from COVID. If you belong to certain uh, zip codes you may have more uh, pos possibilities of not receiving any support economic support to waive the confinement and therefore these characteristics that are always linked to these human rights violations happen at the city level, happen at the local level. So if we don't have the cities aware, alerted, committed to these agendas, it's not going to work because you can legislate and you can have many decisions, uh, good decisions that we celebrate in many countries that have really pursued the SDGs. Uh, if we don't have this uh, engagement with the city level, engagement and understanding of what is delivered at the, at the city level is not going to work. So I commend, I commend your commitment. I'm, I'm really glad to say that uh, one of the great assets uh, that UNESCO has 
is the network of cities and the social and science sector that I, now I'm uh, represented here have the inclusive cities. And this is again to increase our efforts against discrimination, to increase our effort against racism and to increase our efforts for gender equality, for the support of LGBT, for all the things that you believe in and that, and that is high in the agenda and high in the academy and that we will be supporting going forward. So thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela, and, uh, and, and getting again that link between the human rights and, uh, and uh, the SDGs is, is so crucial. And, and uh, I think you're right in pointing to that the current crisis uh, may actually carry with it that it has been has exposed the, the inequalities and the human rights challenges at the local level. So it may help to push it. I saw Nara, do, did you want to? Uh, unless someone who hasn't spoken would like to, uh, but but I just want to exactly follow up on on that. And and Gabriella has put the the inclusion uh, umbrella on it. But I think the point I'd love to make to to local authorities is this point of data. You know, we we still struggle uh, with uh, qualitative and quantitative data that really captures the scale of what we uh, certainly Gabriella and I, who who co-chair a working group on on leaving no one behind and the normative agenda in in the UN. But we can talk about homelessness and, and informal settlements, but we do need better data collection, more disaggregated uh, data that allows us to compare populations and understand better how we can produce the remedies that we need for inequality and discrimination, including multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. And again, local authorities can, can do pilots, can be more I think innovative can be more liberated from the structures at the federal and the national level. And I would make a plea that that's what we need to make our policies really work and stick and lead the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and I was uh, uh, wondering, uh, may I uh, uh, secret, secret uh, if, if, sort of, if, if you have something to say on, on sort of the, the data collection in, uh, in GRAS uh, on some of these issues? Yes, I'm happy to explain that to you. Graz publishes a human rights report every year. And I believe that if more cities would do that, I have a dream, namely that UNESCO uh, that UNESCO has one human rights city on each uh, country. And uh, so let me come back to the annual report. With the NGOs and our network partners, we write this human rights report. And I have no influence on that. Local politicians do not influence that. It's the NGOs and our partners that write that. And every year, this report lists areas of improvement where we can become better. And I believe if we succeed in convincing other cities to write a similar report, then this would certainly contribute to better comparability. But I would also like to add that 20 years ago, we were discussing quite different topics on our at our local level because regions are all different and cities are different but i believe that reports standardized reports to be published by all human rights cities we will have uh, we can make a stride forward what we also do here in graz is that we monitor the life quality. So we establish indicators of life quality and we determine these uh, parameters by sending surveys to our citizens. And in this questionnaire, we ask our people, what is important to you in your district with regards to discrimination, safety on the streets, etc." And then we ask, and this is important, do you see your demands, your requirements fulfilled by the city of Graz? And so based on this questionnaire, we have 
an overall picture. For example, in terms of education, we ask all the families whether they are happy with the school provision. And then if people tell us, yes, we are happy with the provision, uh, then we are happy. If not, we adjust our provision. So we have a wealth of data available, and I think it would be useful to compare these data for providing that example from from grass and the uh, uh, and the uh, survey that uh, that you do and they still say the data you get in uh, because i think it's uh, it's one of the elements that we see in in many uh, cities that is actually there's i would also say there's seem to be a fear almost to to ask the citizens how are you uh, what what are the issues that you would like us uh, to address and uh, and i think that's the only way forward to really understand what the the concerns are and again i'm so pleased that in the outcome document that that is particularly highlighted and and here i would like to turn to you michael uh, uh, because i mean you are with the fundamental rights agency sort of uh, from the very beginning focusing very much on the evidence based uh, advice i mean really bringing that into I would say European politics on uh, in relation to uh, and uh, development of new legislation and other the the data getting asking people uh, about their situation violence against women ethnicity uh, different sorts of discrimination. So, uh, Michael, can you say enlighten us a bit on on that? Would you? Uh, thanks, thanks, Martin. I, I think these topics have already been well introduced, and I don't want to, I want to, don't want to cover ground already uh, spoken. Um, but back to back to data and the need, the absolute need, and I completely agree with Nada on the need for disaggregated data that exposes the vulnerabilities, that identifies the intersectionalities. This all goes without saying, uh, but. Um, we're, 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 we're focused on Graz today, a European city, and I'd have to say that within the EU, we have to do an awful lot better. We still have major data gaps, uh, uh, particularly at the national level. We're bad, by and large, at collecting data on patterns of hate and hate crime, for example. We're bad, uh, by and large, at collecting data on violence against women. So we have to do much better, be it at national or local level. Um, the second thing we have to acknowledge, I think it's important today in the context of human rights related data, is that it's not cheap. It's resource intensive uh, and it can't be done on the cheap. What I mean by that is take, for example, working with a vulnerable at the margins community such as the Roma, six million Roma, the most marginalized people in the EU. Um, you can't just do an online survey. Uh, to, to, to engage with Roma and find out what the issue is or isn't. You have to be on the ground working very closely over time. Uh, and um, and this, this, as I say, requires a commitment of resources. And I, I, I don't want to be sort of the spoiler of today's discussion, uh, but we, we, we have to acknowledge that and engage with it. And by the way, there's a further complication in times of COVID that exactly the kind of on the ground engagement that you need with at-risk groups becomes well nigh impossible uh, in, in the current uh, uh, pandemic context. Um, I, I want to pick up what Mayor, Mayor Nagel said about partnerships. I think he's spot on that we can we can engage some of these resource gaps uh, by cities partnering up. Every city is different, but there is mutual learning and there is cooperation. And it's not just uh, uh, within a within a state. It's 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 more broad than that. And uh, 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 and again, we know it from our work, Morton. I inherited many files when I came to the Fundamental Rights Agency from you. So I'm speaking to the converted in terms of how we can learn from each other. Now, I, I just want to say a word about not the nature of the data gathering and its importance, but the how of data gathering, uh, which is that for the right to be seriously a rights based approach, it has to be about partnership. It has to be a, a partnership between the data gatherers and the rights holders. And there's a few qualities to that that I think need to be flagged today. The first is it's not short term. It's about relationship. It's about investing in relationship uh, over, over the longer term. Uh, and, and it won't work if it's just in and out with a particular data gathering project. Second, it involves an investment in, in all manner of new types of official at the city level, uh, such as cultural mediators. And again, the concept of a cultural mediator is still rather alien in many European cities, but it's imperative that people work in the public service who can build a bridge 
with various communities, particularly those uh, uh, most at the edges. Uh, and then the third thing, which we, we hear a lot of frustration about across uh, Europe, is the need for better participation process. Uh, we, we, a, a better way to meaningfully and respectfully engage with each other. Um, very closely related to that last point, and I'll wrap up here, is everything we do has to be gendered, obviously. That goes without saying. It maybe hasn't been flagged yet today, but it, it should be just like a, a golden thread through everything we say, that the experience of women is different to that of men, girls to boys. Uh, and it has to be age sensitive. And I chose that category now to wrap up because um, as part of my job, I'm well these days virtually traveling around Europe, but I'm hearing so much frustration from youngsters that they've got so many ideas that there's so much they want to say about how their country gets run, how their city gets run, and nobody's listening. Uh, and, and so we let's invest also at the city level in, 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 in youth spaces uh, where they can not just be listened to pro forma, but really engage with the, the future of their cities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. I see uh, Gabriela. And I, yes, uh, everybody I, just show their hand if they want to. <laughs> I, I just want to I was I just want to chip in because uh, this conversation is quite quite uh, uh, revealing. I, I could not agree more in the sense that and this is the core of what we're doing today. We have an institute, we have an academy, we have people committed. We, we have uh, the, the, the outcomes uh, document that, that has so many good um, elements there to continue. And we have the champions around the table and, and the mayor and, and, and the city. The point is that is not only about data because the research is really important and the research is unveiling, is always unveiling. And I take the point of what Michael said about women. Uh, if you do not have the data in terms of how women fare, in terms of economic outcomes, in terms of opportunities, in terms of representation, in terms of uh, you, uh, of course, do not have this trigger to act, but it's not enough because we have the data women, we have it. We know that violence is increasing by 30% in France and 40% in Colombia and 50% in Mexico. We have it. What we need to do is to link that information, that research that we will be just pushing it forward uh, with all of our colleagues. But we need to have responsible governance. We need to have institutions that deliver for that. And this is what I feel that the training aspect is so important because sometimes people just get used to it to these narratives of discrimination because it just happens and you just normalize situations that should not be normalized. And I feel that this is also on us to go beyond what the figures tell us to go for very effective policies. And there are many tools that the cities have to really deliver for this. So I think it's the whole package that I want to bring to the conversation. Mm -hmm. No, very important point, absolutely. Uh and I think we recognize it everywhere. Uh, Siegfried, I saw your hand. Yeah, um, ich denke, dass... Uh, yes. I think participation of the civil society is a really important issue. At the moment, we have set many steps to involve the citizens in Graz more. We are currently conducting an experiment of a citizen's budget, which means we give our citizens smaller budgets, but citizens of the city of Graz, also young people that you've mentioned before, can be part of this process. They can also decide what they need for their quality of life where they live. This is one part of what we do, these budgets. I'd also like to speak a few words of encouragement. I've been part of this for 20, for 22 years. I've been in the local uh, municipal go government for 20 year, 22 years. We've started with a very simple image. We said we want to strengthen human rights here on site. Now our vision is bigger. We want to share our experiences with others, share our propose, proposals with others. We work with really interesting projects. For example, the question of Roma. We had this discussion of beggars in Graz and had a very strong line. At the moment, this discussion is really different. We are supporting a school project. We have started an agricultural project. And yes, we've also spent some money as a city, but we are also successful with it. When we deal with human rights, we need endurance and we do not have the organizations back then we have today now at local level we have developed respective respective institutions 
Let me mention a few institutions that we have established. We didn't have them 20 years in Grau. And these institutions do not only gather data, but they deal with people who have problems. Usually it's NGOs. For example, we have the Human Rights Advisory Council. We have an integration office in Graz. We are, uh, we are part of the European Cities Coalition Against Ra Racism. We also have a biannual Human Rights Award. So once every two years, we award people who really promoted human rights in Graz. We also have a poverty report that is discussed by the municipal council. We also have an anti-discrimination office in the province of Styria. We have an office for peace and development where many people work full time and address the problems in settlements, in shared communities and houses. We also have an advisory council for migrants. Uh, we also have an advocate for children and young people. So every year we've kind of added another institution to what we do. And I'd really like to encourage all of you. We are now even, we have the big honor to be a training center and combining administration policy, but also using the knowledge that we have from the city. The University of Graz with this center can be an advisor for us and can help us promote our work. And human rights work is always work that should be directed towards the future. A very important example again. I mean, it's so so rich. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I think let's let's move on uh, now to uh, the next question. And here I turn to you, uh, Gerd Oberleitner. Um, and uh, the collaboration between political decision makers at local level and science, how, how do you see that that can be, be strengthened? I mean, that's sort of the essence of, of your post, I guess. Uh, and how can we also enhance mutual trust in situations where the trust is, is eroding? So uh, over to you, Gert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with, with all of you. Uh, it's a shame we cannot welcome you here in Graz in person, but uh, this is better than nothing. So glad to see you uh, again and meet you here on this on this venue. Um, and of course, we are happy as a university and in my position as a chair at the university, happy to contribute to all these endeavors. But of course, this raises also bigger problems of the role of the research community on the, on the, on the local level. Um, I think what we have agreed on and seen is that uh, the importance of uh, evidence-based decision-making uh, on local human rights issues is, is somewhat obvious and, and has examples. It is obvious because you see that this kind of scientific base um, of decision-making allows human rights to be realized in a way that is, um, that is outcome-oriented on the local level, that is, uh, that is sustainable, and that, that also is likely to enjoy the support of the local communities. Uh, when you base decisions on, on that scientific basis. I, I think it's also worth reminding ourselves that universities and higher research institutions have long accepted that they have what they call a third mission. That is the role of having an impact on society on top of teaching and research, um, which is highly relevant, of course, in, in uh, the city context and highly relevant when it comes to human rights at the local level. And this is just an example, perhaps. Um, so there's no question that what you have said, this cooperation between the local level and uh, the researchers is important, but it's also a very fragile, um, a very fragile relation. It's fragile because the, the human rights research community needs to take a few things into account when engaging with the local level. Our academy, I think, has clearly shown this. Participants has, have asked for contextualizing research on the local level. Uh, and local administrations and researchers need to find a common human rights language to start with so that they understand what they're talking about. Um, research has been seen as um, collaborative. Uh, and of course, the city at the local level is the space and the place where this can unfold. Um, now, this is fine with cities where you have a strong, thriving research community and human rights programs and human rights chairs. But this is not the case everywhere. And I think this is also why last week the participants in the conference very much focused on solidarity and cooperation in worldwide knowledge sharing. Yeah? This is a joint endeavor that we have to have. Um, and it was also highlighted that perhaps we, look into, we have to look into our research methods. Um, all too often it has already been highlighted we are doing research on the local community, but we should be doing it with the local community, particularly with, with vulnerable groups. 
Um, so there is a role for the research community. But having said that, I think it's also important to point out that research may support the local level, but it has its own demands, its own needs. Huh? Um, it, it has frequently mentioned also in our discussions that the prerequisite for the credibility and the quality of research on human rights at the local level is scientific freedom um, and, and academic freedom, which includes transparency of data, availability of data. We know that disrespect for human rights very often goes hand in hand with disrespect for independent research. Um, and I think local governments, human rights cities in particular have, and they often do uh, play a role in protecting academic freedom, uh, in protecting those that are prosecuted because of their, of their research. Um, so I'm convinced that, uh, that the research community and local actors need to go this, this way together. I'm also convinced that there is a benefit in it. I mean, the local research is an asset for a city. It's a space where we meet, where we innovate, where we are creative. Yeah? And this space needs to be fostered and that's a joint endeavor. So I, I think there is, a, there is a long way to go with challenges, but an important one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Kiet. Uh, again, uh, this uh, com finding the common, common language uh, and also is, is crucial and as, as well as you pointed to the uh, uh, working with the communities and not just study study the communities and and that of course is for many researchers an additional complexity nada then i see michael thank you uh, uh i wanted to say in addition and i think that's really very uh, eminently sensible uh, as well to to understand it's a little bit of introspection i mean i think that the academic community needs to make its findings a little bit more accessible, because I think we, we have had this problem. So the common language is a great one to start with. And certainly the independence of, of voice is, is a very strong one. Let me say, we've been very worried. Uh, I'm sure Michael has found the same uh, about the shrinking civic space that has happened, particularly this last year. I think Michael alluded to it as well. But I think the other thing is the facilitation of interaction between researchers and policymakers, which quite often falls to third parties, quite honestly. And I think that that sort of my role or Gabriella's, I mean, as offices, um, as entities uh, with multi-stakeholder communications, I'm reminded anecdotally of a panel that we tried to convene in my time at UNESCO between decision makers and researchers. And it was as if they were, I mean, there was no communication. The policymakers insisted the research is late, it's not timely, it's irrelevant to the problems at hand. The researchers insist that nobody wants scientific based anything. They want political expediency. And, 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 and that was really stark. We had you know, five ministers and then five research institutions. And it was very funny because they were speaking across each other. But I think we understand how through a, a constant consultative approach, pretty much what GERD is, is. And again, the local can show the way. So um, I'm very optimistic that we can crack this nut, but we've got to keep at it. <laughs> Thank you, Nada. Uh, Mike? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, gosh, there's so much to comment on. And the chat box is amazing. I'm trying to follow it, but it's impossible to read it and at the same time listen. Um, different things here. Uh, first, I just want to really express appreciation to Kerz and to what the University in Graz has done. Um, I, I've spent a lot of my life in university jobs, always struggling with what we in English call the town gown relationship, uh, how the university is relevant to its local community. And I think what you're doing in Graz is such a good example uh, of the potentiality there. And uh, beyond human rights, let's get this message out more generally, because this isn't just good for human rights, it's good for universities. And uh, again, just well done. Um, there was an interesting comment from one, uh, it's way back up the chat, but uh, somebody asked about how we challenge um, interpretations of, of culture, which end up being repressive of human rights. And that's a huge issue, obviously, but I thought the university is so well placed uh, uh, given its nature and function to trigger debates about culture, uh, uh, including at the local level. So uh, I would say to the gentleman who put, I think it's a man who put the question on the long list there, uh, that uh, you know, I think a university is a very well-placed forum uh, to have those necessary debates. Uh, the shrinking space, uh, I, 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 the challenges to civil society. Let me just again pick up from Nada from your your cue, if you will. And I mean, we've as, we're as much worried about this within the EU context as externally. And in fact, the broad categories the UN has long since identified for pressure. We can see the same the the, the pressure being in 
in, within the EU also following the same categories. It's about uh, uh, challenges to resources. It's about lack of meaningful participation. It's about physical threats. We don't have them everywhere in the same manifestation, but we have, uh, we have enough concerns there uh, for it to stay top of the agenda. And I want to finish with something, Martin. I'm abusing your, your, your courtesy as, my, as our chair here, uh, because this is out of the blue and it didn't come up with anybody else, but I don't want to not say it today. And that is that increasingly cities are being asked to manage the rollout of vaccines for COVID. I can think of hardly a more important moment to test the human rights integrity and the human rights commit commitment of cities. Uh, they are in the front line of ensuring vaccine justice. Uh, and um, I think it'd be odd if we didn't at least acknowledge that today at this particular moment in 2021. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. And also thanks for uh, bringing that up. It was definitely uh, right. So I think I will now turn to uh, the last uh, question. Uh, time is in a good discussion like this is running fast. Uh, so uh, here I would like to turn to you, to you Nada. This, uh, uh, this last week has actually provided a very exciting platform as, as you sense uh, from this discussion as well as uh, from the outcome document of, of uh, researchers, uh, local government, international organizations, a lot of key actors coming together uh, for a, a good period of time to discuss uh, these issues. How can you see, uh, sort of say, how can we continue this dialogue at all these different uh, levels? Is there a role that the, the Office of the High Commissioner can play? And afterwards, I will probably turn to UNESCO as well, to Gabriela and ask her, but uh, Nada? Thank you, Martin, and, and thank you, everyone. I mean, I think the rich uh, insights, uh, the experience that we've seen on this panel, just grass alone, uh, we've learned a lot. I think this, we are fully committed to continuing this dialogue uh, in the context of the academy and moving forward. Uh, I think the peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, between the local authorities and across the local authorities to other communities, I think we also have a very good sense of where there may be gaps, deficits that we need to cover in terms of accessibility. Uh, the capacity building is going to be critical. I think we understand that these things don't happen overnight. Uh, again, as the mayor has, has explained, uh, these are little experiments, they're tests, they're trials, they're pilots, and we need to build uh, that body of knowledge and then make sure that we can uh, share it. And I think we need to encourage some leapfrogging. Not everyone has to go through 15 years to get it. We now have to codify this knowledge and understand how it can be made accessible to those who are just starting. We're going to step up all of our efforts. We've started a, a very uh, dynamic uh, conversation with the UCLG. Uh, we want to create a community of stakeholders uh, to find uh, more collaborative ways, I think, of implementing, not just talking about, but implementing human rights at the local level. Um, I think we understand the breadth of the partnership and just this short conversation among this panel member Statistical offices, academia, national human rights institutions, we're going to put it all in the mix. Um, and I think, I hope that everyone keeps our toes to the fire. Gabriela, I'm sure will agree with me. We, will, we won't need prodding, but we certainly may need reminding at some stage among all the other priorities, but we're going to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nada. I think I can assure you that you will be reminded if we <laughs> that you're falling behind, but I'm sure you will not. Uh, Gabriela? No, I, I agree with you. I, I'm sure she, she's not going to fall behind. Uh, but I feel that that uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the fact that uh, we are recognizing, uh, even though this celebration is about the city's action, the, the local action to defend hum, human rights, that, there, that, that this uh, uh, agenda requires uh, all hands on deck and that we need to bring everybody together. We have heard it, the civil society, we have heard it engaging with different uh, 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 cities and networks. Let me tell you that at, at UNESCO, we had just in the, in the last executive board, um, our members decided that uh, we should go for a very strong roadmap against racism and discrimination. They launched a global call against racism, because as I said, if we look at the numbers, uh, the pandemic has just exposed that uh, the, the, the nature of these problems are syndemic, meaning that uh, vulnerable groups that have always had it harder in their lives are actually having higher impact in terms of the pandemic on their health, on their economy, on their education, on every single ground. 
And I have to say that uh, when you see this happen, you wonder how much we are really delivering on this uh, human rights agenda. So we will be launching this, and, and I think it's very important that we get together to for the next step because we cannot do this without the uh, cities. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, institutional capacities. We will be looking at uh, scanning, and because, as I said, there are so many features, even in our legislations, and I have to say, even in the most advanced economies, sometimes features that uh, might open the door for, for, for some violations of human rights, and we need to be very careful about that. But more than anything, to bring together the good experiences. I would love to hear about the good experiences. Grass is, is, is paramount. The, the university has made amazing uh, research. It would be great to get together. I, I said we have the ICAR network, we have the ECAR network uh, of cities for inclusion. Uh, and sometimes we get overwhelmed by the by the facts and the and and it seems that uh, we are not making enough progress but the fact is if we can inject interject in this conversation the good practices the benchmark the inspiring stories i think and then and then we we just share it among each other to to almost bottle them and bring them to some other context i think that will be great and and i think it's also in the spirit in which all this uh, work uh, with the city of grass had been made uh, between unesco and ourselves and I have also to thank the delegation and the ambassador and the minister. I think that they have been, been great champions and we will continue having uh, your support to advance this important agenda. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. And I, I must say I share very much with you uh, that uh, promising practices uh, are very energizing and it sort of sparks also the sense that it is possible. There are possibilities. It's not just all in vain or impossible. Uh, so thanks for that. Michael? Uh, thanks, Morten. Uh, let me just take the opportunity to recommit the Fundamental Rights Agency to this work. Uh, I, I recommit us to finding ways to be research partners with cities. Um, we've already done quite good work in terms of also of identifying good practice around integration of Roma, uh, as well as the deinstitutionalization of persons with disabilities. In both cases, profoundly local uh, learnings were needed in order to make progress and we'll continue to seek and make such partnerships. Uh, we'll also continue to give a space for discussion of this topic and not least in our fundamental rights forum, the next of which will take place in October of this year. It'll be a hybrid event. You don't have to come to Vienna anymore, uh, 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 but uh, the, the role of the humanized city will be an important dimension. Um, third, as I mentioned earlier, we'll stay focused on supporting the development of the framework of commitments uh, for human rights cities. And that brings me just to a, a last idea to leave with um, all the participants, and that is whether the time has come for us to establish a brand, the human rights city brand in a more structured way. Um, I think, for example, of the A status of national human rights institutions on, under the Paris principles, or the achievement of the title of European city of culture. Um, uh, have we reached a moment of maturity of the human rights cities movement where an agreement across the different organizations and indeed the other different regions uh, uh, could be made towards such a mark of quality. Perhaps the time has come or if not come is very near indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thanks for bringing that to the table. Uh, I think that will probably sort of be sort of opening up a, a, a big new discussion here, but, uh, and I would just say there's one thing you may have misunderstood is that we really want to come to Vienna. Uh, and then we can always continue to grass uh, uh, and come and visit there. I think that would be a nice yep. human rights city hop uh, from uh, Vienna to, to grass. So maybe in October next year, we should plan something. I think we have a sort of a coming to uh, the end of this uh, panel discussion. And I must say, I've been, been very uh, stimulated with, with, your, uh, with your insight and your analysis of this. And of course, uh, here in the last round, also the the commitments, uh, but you, I will not let you totally off the hook when it comes to commitments. So I would just like you sort of, an, uh, uh, now leaving the, the panel, if you could each of you give a, a one minute uh, uh, statement on uh, what the key message you take away from the uh, outcome document. What is it that you think this is both, it's great, but it's also what I would work with. So, um, do we start with you, Michael? I see your hand uh, is up there and then... 
It's only up, Martin, because I forgot to take it down. Oh, old, old, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how it is. Uh, yeah, well, look, let me let me just say, I've said an awful lot. Let me just say well done to Graz for showing us the, the solid leadership, for reminding us of the link between the city and the academy, which is crucial to progress uh, and uh, just, um, you know, forts a strength to all of us as we move this forward. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Gabriella? I would again say congratulations for, for this new infrastructure that, that fills us with a lot of uh, energy. I would say that we need to really make things concrete. When we deal with human rights, we need to make it concrete and to go to the issues at hand. And, and, this, and this conference, of course, allowed also to show the relevance to the right of science in practice, which is another angle that we'll be looking at, promoting uh, the right to science. Nara? Thanks very much uh, to all my fellow panelists. Thank you, Morten. I think uh, I love the outcome document. I mean, I think it could even teach us a few things, huh, Gabriella, all that we struggle with in finding outcome documents. It's very well drafted. I love that it is multidimensional and multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder. I mean, I think that's a real strength that it, it, it includes a lot of uh, aspects. Let me say one thing we will do moving forward is, is thinking about the communications and advocacy effort. There was a comment in the chat, I think, you know, <clears throat> we can do all that we can if we're not talking about it. <clears throat> Sorry, enough, uh, I think there will be an issue. Um, but we really look forward to, to amplifying uh, the voice of, of local authorities and making sure that they remain um, front and center in some of our own advocacy work moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kier? Um, thank you. I think our hope with this event and also with the outcome document was now that human rights go local. We also want to make human rights research go local uh, and go really local. Um, so this is the hope that this, this document and, and the whole event is, is the kind of framework that will allow us all uh, to move forward with some kind of knowledge sharing in that area and also with that kind of applied human rights research and that practical experience sharing that Nada has referred to. Uh, we hope to have kicked off uh, uh, with with our event, and uh, of course, we stand ready to contribute in this in this regard. Thank you. And I deliberately uh, left our host uh, to the uh, to be the last. And uh, so, uh, over to you, Mayor Nagel. Yeah. Vielen uh, Dank. Ich habe auch. Thank you very much. I was reading the chat and there were many questions raised in the chat. And before I conclude with a summarizing statement, I'd like to come back to it. I believe that human rights education in schools and in educational institutions must play a major role. I believe that at the local level, together with educationalists, we need to cooperate in this field. We have some nice examples. Just recently, we had a human rights tramway in Graz. Uh, the tramway was designed by pupils, by students, and I'm sure this is an experience that they will never forget in their life. Education is the key, and it is also the key in matters of human rights. Another topic that Michael mentioned was the vaccination, whether everybody has access to a vaccine. Uh, I can share the following with you. We had a meeting this morning. I And we make sure that we provide everybody in our city, whether it's people with a migrant background, whether it's old people. Old people sometimes do not have access to a notebook or they do not know how to use it or people who do not have the financial means cannot access uh, the website through their notebooks. So we have hundreds of people sitting on telephones, taking calls. We also provided information about the vaccines uh, in several languages at the city level so that all our citizens have access to this information. Two things are very important to me. First, the cooperation to spread the idea of human rights cities and that we network these cities even more closely. The more cities there are, the better. And the second important message that I am taking home with me today, and which is also based on the declaration, is that the human rights cities should now 
receive a binding standard. So far, we have just all doing our bit and working for ourselves, but now we have the experience and now we are able to define the standards and encourage other cities, other mayors and other local politicians. Uh, because we do have the information and we can include it in the catalog and provide this to our colleagues. I think that is very important. And finally, I really regret very much that I am not able to welcome you here, to shake your hands here today, uh, but we will not give up. We will certainly invite you back to come to Graz at later times. Today, the weather wouldn't have been so far so nice anyway, but uh, it is a human right to have enough water. <laughs> we had it today. So um, thank you very much for uh, participating in this conference. Thank you very much for taking these important steps with us. Thank you very much for celebrating 20 years of Human Rights City and for celebrating the establishment of the UNESCO Center together with us. Thank you very much. Uh, virtual hospitality. It has been a great uh, pleasure and thanks very much to the panel that has uh, uh, offered a lot of uh, insight, knowledge and foresight. So I think there's a lot for us to, to build on from uh, this past week as well as uh, uh, this uh, panel. So thanks a lot and uh, keep Thank up. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Morten. Thank you um, to you and all the panelists for these fruitful and inspiring contributions, which will certainly help to pave the way to build bridges between local governments and the scientific community to promote human rights. Before Klaus Stahl will shed some light on the next steps planned by the UNESCO Center, allow me to show a brief personal look into the history, um, which led to this conference and the presiding academy. Back in 1999, the European Training and Research Center for Human Rights and Democracy was founded by three academics, including myself, with a close link to our university. Then the ETC, with a team of young researchers, supported the birth of the declaration of the City Council of Graz on 8th February 2001, committing itself to become the first human rights city in Europe. The EDC has further been engaged in supporting the implementation of this commitment for the last 20 years. And based on these practical experiences, the idea to go international is the focus on protecting and promoting human rights at the local and regional level was developed. Eventually, the ETC felt ready to apply for the status of an international center under the auspices of the UNESCO, a project meticulously planned and, and pursued with admirable endurance by Klaus Stahl. The ambitious goal to convince UNESCO that there is a competent team to fulfill the qualifications of a category two center in Graz finally has been achieved. And this conference clearly shows that it already bears fruit. Having heard their voices during the last two hours, we can look forward to translating the proposals into practice, which were adopted by the participants in the academy and supported by the speakers in this conference. Please, Klaus, what will be the next steps in this successfully started process? Thank you, Renate. This is Thank you very much, Renate. Well, after the conference is before the next conference, we are already negotiating and have uh, started conversations and discussions with our partners about the third volume of the series of documents that we are publishing. We are already planning the topic for the next academy and for the next conference. I believe that the discussion that we have just had the pleasure of hearing is a very important input 
and it provides us with essential ideas because it tells us where we need to cooperate at an international level, where we need to take concrete steps, such as was expressed by Gabriela. Theory is not enough, we need action in the cities. Of course, the closing document will provide a vital basis, the objective of the UNESCO chair and the UNESCO category two center is to act as a global clearinghouse for human rights research and practice. We want to facilitate exchange. We want to facilitate the implementation. We want to create bridges between interest groups and all levels of governance. Last but not least, I would like to congratulate everybody for the success of this conference. I'd like to thank everyone involved for the supporters, for the stakeholders. I would like to thank the interpreters who made the exchange in several languages possible here today. I would like to thank the engineering team for the successful organization of this virtual conference. I would like to thank the team of the chair and the team of the UNESCO Center. And in particular, I would like to thank and congratulate Wanda Tiefenbacher, the organizer of this conference, who has dedicated the past four months since October to prepare this conference. Thank you everybody for your highly valued input. And uh, I can assure you, we will meet again in February 2022 at the latest. Goodbye.